Hi, everyone. Yay. Yay, the Artist Lecture Series. Thanks, Shah, for, for organizing this and bringing us all together every week. Um, it's my pleasure and delight to introduce poet, essayist, publisher, and professor Brian Teer to the Evergreen community. After over a decade of teaching and writing in the San Francisco Bay Area, Brian comes to us today from Temple University in Philadelphia, where he recently began working as an associate professor and where he runs his press, Albion Books, which publishes limited edition chapbooks of poetry and experimental prose of the highest caliber. If you're interested in contemporary poetics and book arts, write in your notebooks, Albion Books, check out the website, and the books are exquisite. Um, Brian's accomplishments and contributions to contemporary poetry are numerous, and I'll just name a few here. A former Stegner Fellow at Stanford University, Brian Teer is the recipient of poetry fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the McDowell Colony, the Marin Headland Center for the Arts, and the American Antiquarian Society. He's the author of four full-length books, The Room Where I Was Born, Sight Map, The Lambda Award-Winning Pleasure, and most recently, Companion Grasses. He's also published seven chapbooks, Pilgrim, Transcendental Grammar Crown, Paradise Was Typeset, Helplessness, Black Sun Crown, and Soar Eros. One of the reasons I'm so happy that Brian Teer is with us today is that for me, he exemplifies the sort of writing life I hope that students of writing and art here at Evergreen will embrace, and at once erudite, voraciously curious, committed, and yet deeply, and I'm going to say virtuously, social form of the writer's life in which the writer both excels at their own craft and contributes to building literary community by writing about and publishing the work of others, as well as running reading series and so forth. In this way, Brian models what it means to truly flourish as a writer, producing work of great rigor and inventiveness without giving in to a narrow and narcissistic careerism. There is this myth that one cannot be both in service to the community and excel at one's work. Brian Teer is the kind of writer whose practice and good works, if I may use that religiously tinted phrase, dispel that myth, showing the intimate imbrications of aesthetic and political work, taking seriously Wittgenstein's proposition that aesthetics and ethics are one. And perhaps the religious tint to the phrase good works is not altogether misplaced. Brian has found his subject matter at the crossroads of a range of lineages, including the erotic ecologics of Whitman and the transcendentalists, and the holistic politics of feminist and queer political philosophies. His deeply historically informed and yet utterly contemporary poetics luminously disclose the interanimating relations between the erotic, the political, and the ecological. The ecological is primary for this writer, as skeleton key, as bellwether, as source of all signifying. We speak of ecological remediation to rid our world of toxins. Brian's work reminds us that language may also be understood in ecological terms. What might the remediation of language involve? We remediate soil where the nutrients have been stripped by overuse and monocropping, gravely consequential errors rooted in a fundamental misapprehension of what the world is and what our relation to the land ought to be. So remediation involves restoring nutrient density, vigor, fertility to the, so to speak, underplot. Brian's writing for me does this with language, remediating its metabolic range and potentials. The title of his most recent book, Companion Grasses, makes reference not only to the mutual interdependence of botanical forms, but to the possibility of a companionate rather than objectifying relation to our environments and to the poet's long vocation to retrieve this intimacy of splendor in the grass and glory in the flower. One way to befriend, to find companions in all manner of living forms is by means of the sort of attentiveness that writing demands and calls forth, where we look to see, to feel, to think ever more intimately with our world, working through the seemingly relentless political and bodily traumas these worlds, domestic, national, and so forth, visit upon us, but also, crucially, as part of delighting in, as Brian Teer does so exquisitely, the particularities of the world, celebrating, as Darwin put it, its endless forms most beautiful. Please give Brian Tier a warm welcome. I feel deeply humbled by that intro. 
Um, I know. I can't be that close to it. Does that work? Yeah, okay, I can't make out with it, but I can be <laughs> close. Um, thank you all for your attention, and thank you all for having me here. Uh, the plan is that I am going to give a talk. It's going to be in three parts. Um, one that's written out a sort of improvisational bridge about dolphins and whales, and then a final, more written out part. It is a talk about my own interests as what people call an eco-poet or someone who's interested in eco-poetics um, and ethics and the kind of relationality that Miranda was talking about. Um, if there's time left over, I will also read a poem at the end. Um, before the Q&A, but I am far more interested in talking with you than in reading my own poems, so you can find my poems out in the world. Um, and I just wanted to say, I'm gonna be referencing some of the, this first talk is, is tilted toward theory a little bit, toward, toward critical theory, and so I'm gonna be referencing names. Don't worry if you don't follow some of the nuances. I think that my major points come through clearly anyways, and then if you do have a question about like, what the hell were you talking about in that when you said blah, 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 just ask at the end, and I will be <laughs> totally forthcoming about whatever it was I meant to say. So this first part is, a, it has a title, and the title is actually three lines from a poem by Ed Roberson um, from a poem called Eclogue. We map our way with only the bearing of surrounding life, itself borderless, uncontrolled by the surface of our self. That's my title. So this excerpt from Roberson's serial poem, City Eclogue, suggests our ultimate context is surrounding life, and that to navigate this surround is a complex task because it, both, it is both borderless and uncontrolled by us. A map that indicates only the bearing of surrounding life would demand we dispense with the compass rose and cardinal directions. Such a map would also demand we dispense with the expedient navigation we've become accustomed to. In asking us to imagine what such a map might be like and how it might shape our travels, I mean to ask if it is possible to create a linguistic event, a text or poem, that does not put human activity alone at the center of itself. I mean to ask what it means to take such care with our language, what it means for our language to care for the phenomenal world in which we are embedded. What does it mean for our language to care for the flora, fauna, rocks, and other biological and geological materials we treat as others and upon whom, upon whom we wreak great violence? I mean to ask what it means for our language to care for surrounding life, but not to take care of it. And I mean to ask us to hear the duality of the phrase to take care of, which can mean both caretaking and killing. And either way implies the kind of hierarchy that underwrites both environmental stewardship and the century of accelerated ecocide we've entered. I mean, as poet and critic Joan Ritalik suggests in What is Experimental Poetry and Why Do We Need It? That an eco-poethics of care entails finding quote, new ways of being among one and others in the world via poetic forms. I mean that each of us is, as Brenda Hillman writes in her poem Economics in Washington, a citizen of matter and beyond, but also that we live alongside non-human companions as citizens in the nation gathered in matter. I know I'm risking a metaphor, an anthropocentric metaphor of talking about matter as a nation, but I wanted to risk it. Um, so though the surrounding life of our non-human companions is a thing we cannot know in its totality, and though its ultimate structures constantly escape scientists, philosophers, poets, and lawmakers alike, we dangerously proceed with science, thought, poetry, and policy as though our ignorance does not matter.
I mean to ask, along with Ritalik, quote, how can the unalike know one another if no means to encounter and experience one another well? I mean that because of the anthropocentric presumptions of hierarchy latent in our cultural heritage. And anthropocentric just means mankind at the middle of everything. The universe revolves around mankind and, and its logics. So because of all of the anthropocentric presumptions of hierarchy latent in our cultural heritage, homo sapiens and the surrounding life language and the surrounding life form a triad whose parts are in unusually fantastic tension. So I do think of this kind of triangle um, when I'm writing between myself and language and surrounding life. Though the roots of anthropocentrism are as old as Western culture itself, as detailed by Peter Coates in his study, Nature, Western Attitudes Since Ancient Times, such anthropocentrism is the precondition of our turning the surrounding life into nature, capital N, nature. And the turn to nature is in fact the precondition for the environmental crisis we find ourselves in. So when I talk about nature, capital N, nature, what I mean is that we turn the surrounding environment into a large scale abstraction that we pretend is like a unified thing and not an enormously complicated set of interlocking systems um, that cannot actually be abstracted into one term. Does that make sense? Okay, some of you are nodding, so I'm not totally full of nonsense. All right, so by nature, I mean a rhetorical figure from which we have exempted ourselves and that we have used, as Timothy Morton points out in The Ecological Thought, to create and sustain fictions of hierarchy, authority, harmony, purity, neutrality, and mystery. Our rhetoric of nature has made possible endless figuration, figurative language and metaphor, as well as endless violence. And it is this relational paradox that concerns me as a poet, as conflict between the aesthetic and the political underwrites the intellectual tradition that has led from environmental writing to ecopoetics. So consider this passage, very short passage from Emerson's essay, Nature. Whoever considers the final cause of the world will discern a multitude of uses that enter as parts into the result. They all admit of being thrown into one of the following classes, commodity, beauty, language, and discipline. So it really matters, to me at least, and I think to our entire American thinking about environmentalism, that Emerson lists commodity first among the world's purposes, and beauty is second, and that these lead both to language and to disciplinary thought. A sometimes fanatical evangelist of nature's servitude to homo sapiens, Emerson makes explicit how commodity and beauty are linked by their use value. He really believes that, and this is a long quote by him, that I find shocking. Nature, in its ministry to man, is not only the material, but also the process and the result. All the parts work incessantly into each other's hands for the profit of man. The wind sows the seed, the sun evaporates the sea, the ice on the other side of the planet condenses rain on this, the rain feeds the plant, the plant feeds the animal, and thus the endless circulations of the divine charity nourish man. Go team God, right? You set up this amazing <laughs> bounty just for us. The whole system is just a big food truck shoveling in time. <laughs> so if during this era of chronic drought, wildfire, and melting ice caps, it seems outrageously cynical to think the very wind sows seed for the profit of man, I'd like to suggest, maybe Monsanto thinks that, right? But Emerson, it's a little shocking. I'd like to suggest that Emerson's imagining of the endless circulations of divine charity also functions as metonymy for a larger tropological problem within the rhetoric of nature that underwrites the intellectual heritage of environmentalism. I mean that work by feminist eco-critics, as various as Carolyn Merchant, Val Plumwood, and Rebecca Solnit, suggest that Emerson, by positing nature's prime function as an endless reproductive circuit whose fruits, as capital or future citizen, 
fall rightly into the hands of man demonstrates the analogical link between the political fate of nature as commodity and that of women's reproductive health within our sociocultural imaginary. I mean that anthropocentrism is also always already phallogocentrism, which basically means that anthropocentrism is already a system that privileges male and patriarchal power and forms of logic. So that if anthropocentrism is always, also always already phallogocentrism, it suggests that a deep-seated misogyny is also one of the cultural preconditions for the emergence of the rhetorical trope of nature. And that as Plumwood, Val Plumwood, who is rad, writes in Feminism and the Mastery of Nature, one of the most common forms of denial of women in nature is what I will term backgrounding, their treatment as providing the background to a dominant foreground sphere of recognized achievement or causation. This backgrounding of women in nature is deeply embedded in the rationality of the economic system and in the structures of contemporary society. What is involved in the backgrounding of nature is the denial of dependence on biospheric processes and a view of humans as a part outside of nature, which is treated as a limitless provider without needs of its own. So I mean that misogyny is also a precondition for our current environmental crisis. And I think that's deeply true. If we weren't a hugely misogynist culture, we wouldn't fuck over the planet the way that we do. So, and though I will return to Plumwood's important notion of our denial of dependence on biospheric processes, I would first like to suggest that the strong analogical link between women and nature, backgrounded though it may be, allows another equally insidious rhetorical trope to emerge, the designation of all forms of queer sexuality and gender as unnatural. And I was trying to talk to another class to ask them if they had ever ever encountered someone trying to claim that gay men were associated with the natural world. You know, like, gay men are always associated, you, you see so much lesbian feminist politics around women being associated with the earth, but there's no, like, gay male, like, maybe there's, you know, a little bit on the fringes, but it's always aestheticized, it's always urban, it's always sort of about artifice. Oscar Wilde, there's very little um, in our cultural imaginary. Again, there is some, and Whitman is a prime example of like, it was there at one point, but it seems with modernity to have kind of vanished. So if our cultural imaginary posits nature as endlessly cyclical and reproductive and analogically links women to nature through their shared capacity for reproduction and their ability to secure for homo sapiens a future, we can see how and why our culture came to figure queers as non-reproductive and thus unnatural, perpetually existing in a rhetorical state that borders upon a form of abjection and a temporality that has no future. It's this kind of figuration that has enabled po politicians to claim AIDS to be either a form of divine punishment or an instance of nature correcting its mistakes, among other horrifying things that they have said. It's also the kind of figuration that has enabled environmentalists to cling to fatally tainted notions of purity, neutrality, and beauty. As Timothy Morton writes in his essay, Queer Ecology, by repressing the abject environmentalisms, I am not denoting particular movements, but suggesting affinities with, say, heterosexism or racism, claiming to subvert or reconcile the subject-object manifold only produce a new and improved brand of nature. Unlike Morton, however, I don't believe ecology is queer theory and queer theory is ecology, though of course I believe that the disciplines can use each other as correctives, by which I mean I could now take this talk in any number of directions. Embedded in the trajectory I've laid out are discourses on the heteronormativity of much environmental writing and activism, as well as the implicit heterosexism of our collective emphasis on futurity. Following these dis discourses, I could also propose a valediction of some form of queer ecology, an embrace of categories of negativity, or a salvo concerning Lee Edelman's claim in his really provocative book, No Future, that truth, like queerness, irreducibly linked to the aberrant or atypical, to what chafes against normalization, finds its value not in a good, susceptible to general generalization, but only in the stubborn particularity that voids every notion of good, 
the embrace of queer negativity then can have no justification if justification requires it to reinforce some positive social value. Its value instead resides in its challenge to value as defined by the social, and thus in its radical challenge to the very value of the social itself. Edelman has created controversy because he's challenged our collective faith in the potential good of human activity and sociopolitical systems. And in this, he's a lot like the mid-century California poet Robertson Jeffers, odd bedfellows though they may be, and they certainly are. <laughs> they would never be in bed together. One is dead, which is why they wouldn't, but <laughs> that hasn't stopped people in the past. Um, it's, I guess, a little like recycling, right? <laughs> Edelman, sorry, that was gross. Um, so Edelman has issued his challenge to heteronormative and assimilationist gay social values via queer theory, while Jeffers issued his challenge to anthropocentrism via poetry, both literary genres that have allowed their rhetorical violence to enter social discourse through highly specialized forms of language that largely shield society from the author's deep desire to do damage. In the case of Edelman's antisocial turn, we witness a strategy of critical reversal, a negation of our culture's fetishistic investment in the rhetorical figure of the child. With great sadistic relish, the following passage famously challenged the child's metonymic representation of our collective future. And this is Edelman. Fuck the social order and the child in whose name we're collectively terrorized. Fuck Annie. Fuck the way from Les Mis. Fuck the poor innocent kid on the net. Fuck laws both with capital L's and with small. Fuck the whole network of symbolic relations and the future that serves as its prop. In the case of Jeffers' inhumanism, we witness a strategy of uncritical reversal, which inverts our culture's a priori evaluations of human and non-human life without too much problematizing of that stance. I'd sooner accept the penalties, kill a man than a hawk, he famously writes in Hurt Hawks. Why? Because of civilization and the other evils it engenders, Jeffers writes elsewhere, misery and riches and squalid savagery, mass war. Where Edelman rages against a collective heterosexist rhetoric that does damage to queer political life, Jeffers' critique of anthropocentrism stems from existential and moral disappointment and centers on the fact that human society has invented morality and the capacity for evil actions, whereas non-human life is structured by imperatives unbounded and uncontrolled by human morals, and thus can do no evil. And though I deeply sympathize with both Edelman and Jeffers in their righteous antisocial anger and believe that the figure of nature functions a lot like the figure of the child in policing the political lives of queers, which I would again reiterate, that in the same way that Edelman sees the child being a kind of um, policing or boundary marker that is used to punish queers, basically, for their non-reproductivity, for their sexual activity that doesn't lead to children or a particular kind of citizenry that is the future. Nature is often employed in very similar ways to punish and um, denigrate queers as, you know, sort of having aberrant behavior that doesn't fit into social categories or social norms. And somehow these society and nature are the same thing, that social order and natural order equal each other, which we all know in our culture is totally not true. So um, I'm suspicious about nature as a rhetorical trope that way. Um, so I mean to hold close, rather than Edelman and Jeffers, I mean to hold close to feminist ambivalence about language and rhetoric and their power to do violence, especially when deployed by men in service of their own agendas of political critique. I mean I would rather suggest that the surrounding life remains the best radical challenge to the very value of the social itself because it cannot be essentialized and in its ontological strangeness remains unknowable in totality. Indeed persisting as a strange stranger that Timothy Morton suggests it is, something that everywhere surrounds our language but cannot quite enter it. I mean I want to end with a valediction of the stubborn particularity we find only in the real and only in attention to the strange strangers with whom we reside there. And though Edelman and Jeffers warn against making such particularities fit into allegories of positive social value, 
I want to suggest, in tandem with the feminist philosopher Elizabeth Grosch in Becoming Undone, that a valediction of the stubborn biological particularities we encounter in the present tense is a resistance of the normalization done in the name of nature and persists as an embrace of the value of differentiation. And this is a quote from her. Difference is not the union of two sexes, the overcoming of race and other difference through the creation or production of a universal term by which they can be equalized or neutralized, but the generation of ever more variation, differentiation, and difference. Difference generates further difference because difference makes inherent the forces of duration, becoming and unbecoming, in all things, in all acts of differentiation, and in all things differentiated. Grosch's hijacking of Darwinian evolutionary principles and in the interest of a proliferation of social difference allows for temporality to be less about the heterosexual reproduction of Homo sapiens and more about duration in its largest sense, futurity less of a single horizon imbued with one universal value dependent on women's reproductivity, and more of a proliferation of various forms of life in various states of becoming and coming undone and with different relationships to futurity. I mean I am making my own figurative analogy between Edelman's stubborn particularity and Grosch's durational differentiation because both of them attempt to resist the rhetoric of an anthropocentric universality that is often implicitly misogynist, heterosexist, and homophobic. And I am in turn linking them to acts of attention that immerse us in the deeply interdependent weave of being that feminist phenomenologist Gail Weiss in Body Images calls intercorporeality. And this is from her. The ground for this ethics is not a categorical imperative, nor is it the transcendence of consciousness as an annihilating activity that refuses too close an identification with any given action, relationship, or situation. Rather, it is an embodied ethics grounded in the dynamic bodily imperatives that emerge out of our own intercorporeal exchanges and which in turn transform our own body images, investing them and reinvesting them with moral significance. In Weiss's book, this is always between humans, but I would argue that that is an anthropocentric move. Why not between many different kinds of species? I mean to suggest that the antisocial turn of recent queer theory could in fact be a turn toward something besides ourselves, toward bodies that indeed challenge the normalized boundaries of the social, rather than difference normally constituted by human bodies designated other by the society and nation, however, the difference toward which we turn might in fact be the bodies of the flora, fauna, and rocks, the strange strangers that surround us wherever we turn. And by we, I don't mean to reify dualist systems by implying that queers and women should carry the burden of representing the body with which they are always already associated, but to ask everyone interested in ecology and environmental justice to pay attention to and value experiences of human, non-human intercorporeality. I mean that such an ecopoethical turn might end the, quote, denial of dependence on biospheric processes, unquote, that Plumwood diagnoses as an essential element in the backgrounding of both women in nature and our sociopolitical realms, and that such a turn might create the embodied ethical transformations and moral significance that Weiss suggests stems from intercorporeal exchanges. Such a turn might also enable queers who have felt I think rightly alienated from the surrounding life by virtue of their abjection from nature, an opportunity to encounter and recognize their own dependence upon biospheric processes and to begin to extend community and care outward. I don't mean to suggest an encounter that becomes an allegory through which Homo sapiens reifies its identity in relation to a non-human other that acts as mere mirror in which man gazes upon himself. I don't mean to suggest an encounter that recapitulates the imperialism of naming or scientific categorization, though meaningful forms of attention might include those gestures. I also don't mean to suggest such an encounter alone might constitute an effective form of environmental salvation. I do mean the immense pressure we put upon our rhetoric and activism is both noble and insane because I'm not sure what local good can be done against widespread environmental destruction sanctioned by our most basic symbolic systems. Along with Jack Collum, who's an amazing poet, 
I'm also suspicious of our anthropocentric emphasis on saving or taking care of the environment through the imposition of more rhetoric, more law, more metaphor, from which totality again escapes. Our vision of the surrounding life, always too small, our knowledge incomplete. Save the act of saving, column rights and things to save, the practice of saving, the habit of saving, the repetition, but also save the resistance to saving in the sense that something saved is imprisoned in a vault under lock and key. I mean, we shouldn't give up rhetoric or activism or care, but we should probably, we probably have to save saving from itself, from becoming just another extension of our anthropocentrism. The bad thing about eco-poetry is that it is language and therefore susceptible to figuration and to philosophical abstraction and to recuperating other forms of hierarchical ordering that can create and enforce social norms. The good that comes of eco-poetry is that its language is resistant to saving meaning under lock and key. It is language often aware of its own materiality and its participation in intellectual and cultural traditions that have been destructive of social freedoms, ecosystems, and species alike. The good of eco-poetry lies in how its content often privileges a proliferation of lived difference, intercorporeal consciousness, and criticality. At the same time, its eco-poetical forms demand of readers the immersion in the present tense that intercorporeality and care both require. Together, its content and forms ask us to remain attentive to linguistic meanings residence in duration and in relation to the surrounding life, without which we would have no bearings at all. So that's part one. I hope that was relatively painless. Oh, and what I'll do, I am going to give the dolphins and whales short shrift which I'm sad about. But I wanted to just draw your attention to, um, you can, guys can go look this up for yourselves. Um, there is a problematic but interesting document called the Declaration of Rights for Cetaceans, Whales and Dolphins. Um, and it is a movement that started out of Helsinki and recently, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but the country, India, recently granted dolphins non human personhood. They're the first country to do this. Um, I actually love it and I also think it's a huge problem. Um, and the reason I think it's a huge problem is because all of the rules for what counts as a non-human person are about people. They mimic all of our social values about humans. These animals have to be intelligent, they have to have societies, they have to have names for each other. And I feel like, what happens to all the dumb animals? <laughs> the answer is we eat them, and we kill them, and we don't care. Um, and I, which is true, right? Like, a tuna is suddenly going to be a non-human person, right? I don't think so. We like tuna way too much. Um, but I also, so to me, there's the anthropocentric problem of, like, granting this one group of species kind of non-human personhood based on all of these qualities that mirror our own culture and society and our own notions of personhood. But also it does the thing that we're so good at, which is, like, sort of electing an exception, protecting them and then throwing the entire bio like bioregional ecosystem out of balance because one species is protected or not protected as in the case of wolves in the in the west and northwest right now where you get rid of the predator and then there's a lot of fat happy deer right for a while um, so I think there's a lot of problems in this idea I think it's beautiful on the one hand that we want to change our thinking around who counts as a citizen and who can be protected and what kinds of rights there are. And the bill of the Declaration of Rights is really beautiful. It's like no slavery um, for these animals, that India was gonna build all these water parks that include performing dolphins and they stopped. Can you imagine the United States doing that? Like they'd be like, um, I'm sorry, we already started the funding process. We can't just stop it when the money is coming in, right? Um, but so you should go look at it because I think it is super interesting issue. It's very current right now. There's a lot of discourse around it, but it shows to me some of the problems with environmental discourse right now as well, that there's a lot of 
thinking about shifting these boundaries between human subjects and things that used to be objects, but how we do that and what rhetoric we do that with and how that translates into legislation is incredibly, incredibly crucial. Because if we shift this legislation and again grant a status to this one species as a non-human person, um, literally every other species pretty much is shut out because very few species show the kinds of qualities that these animals have. And so it's like another caste system, another hierarchy that's going to really destroy further the ecosystem. So I'm gonna read a second, I could go on obviously about that because it's awesome, like I was so touched at first and then I was like, I'm really touched and I'm pissed off which is like getting a Valentine's card from an ex or something. You know, like, it's like, oh, why do I hate this? Even though it seems nice. Um, so I wanted to read a second talk, which I think will take us up to the Q&A. This is called, This is Happening Right Where We Are Living. Um, and it's similar and different. Um, different enough, I think. On September 7, 2011, a month after I moved to Philadelphia, I attended a large and vibrant rally against fracking, a rally timed to coincide with a Marcellus Shale Industry Conference at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. Stationed just outside the center where the leaders of the gas industry surely could hear us, we chanted and sang, heard speeches and testimonies against fracking and the gas industry, and generally made a lot of noise in opposition to the special interests of corporations and the influence they have upon our government. A quickly proliferating industrial practice in rural Pennsylvania and across the country, fracking as a form of natural gas extraction, also known as induced hydraulic fracturing, by which a gas company drills a well into the ground and injects a pressured mixture of salt water and fracturing chemicals. Newly opened channel and the increasing geological pressure result in the release of or access to natural gases that geology had formerly rendered inaccessible. According to activists and many concerned citizens, there are three major problems with fracking. The first is the massive amount of water that must be injected into the ground to make a well functional. Anyway, this always makes me faint. Anywhere between two and three million gallons. And all of it comes out contaminated and undrinkable and pretty much unreclaimable. They just now are starting to be like, maybe we could reuse that water in our wells instead of just throwing it all away. It's like, duh, why didn't you? I mean, if you're gonna be an asshole, be at least a nice asshole about it. <laughs> the second is that 20 to 40% of the water injected into the well returns to the surface as polluted mud and wastewater, both of which are often disposed of in ineffectual holding pools prone to flooding and leakage that allegedly contaminate surface water in the area. The third and most hotly disputed is that many of the fracking chemicals never return to the surface, instead infiltrating the water table and poisoning the wells and drinking water of farms and communities nearby, sickening the human citizens and killing livestock. This last problem is what makes fracking insidious, but the legal difficulty of proving the companies responsible for poison wells and drinking water also has made it almost impossible to fight in courts, where private citizens can't compete with corporations with seemingly limitless funds for legal fees. This particular rally in September was aimed against fracking in a region of northeast Pennsylvania called the Delaware River Basin, which also rests on Marcellus Shale, a particularly porous rock formation known to be rich in both groundwater and natural gas. Up until last fall of 2011, fracking in the basin had been banned, but the Delaware River Basin Commission was soon to be voting about opening up the region to gas companies, and it looked as though Pennsylvania Governor Corbett who's a total asshole, and New Jersey Governor Christie, both of whom are on the commission, were ready to allow gas companies anything. Many citizens were worried and continue to worry about the results of fracking in all locales, but this particular area of the Delaware River Basin supplies drinking water to Philadelphia, Camden, and numerous other communities in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and if polluted would constitute a potentially irreversible natural disaster with unimaginable implications for the health of the region's residents and the ultimate habitability of the watershed. When I write, the rally was large and vibrant. 
I mean 3,000 people gathered in downtown Philly. I mean thousands of signatures were gathered and petitioned both in the street and online. I mean there was widespread and respectful media coverage. The appropriate phone lines were tied up for days. And the Delaware River Basin Commission vote was actually postponed, it seemed, in response to successful activist tactics. And two years later, it still has, they still haven't opened it up, which is awesome. The best news yet, a new date has still not been scheduled for this vote. On February 10th of 2012, however, the state legislature passed a law, HB 1950, that restricts the rights of cities and communities to ban fracking within their limits. This same legislation also grants companies the right to drill near hospitals, schools, private homes, public water reservoirs, and within state forests. Go PA. Further, this law requires doctors, this is the really crazy part, when treating a patient who claims to be suffering from exposure to fracking chemicals, to contact the company and request in writing the names of the chemicals the patient may have been exposed to, and then to keep the details of the patient's case confidential. These companies are also not legally required to reveal the chemical makeup of their fracking fluid if any of the chemicals, quote, are claimed to be a trade secret or confidential proprietary information, a loophole that makes it hard for citizens to prove that their poor health or the bad chemistry of their water was influenced by fracking. The only penalty imposed upon those companies who can drill and store wastewater anywhere they choose, a higher tax must be paid on the gas extracted from each well. And by higher, it's like a smidgen. When I heard the news that the rights of communities, individual citizens, patients, and medical practitioners had been restricted, and essentially almost all public lands in Pennsylvania had been opened up for fracking, I began to weep. How poetic, you might say. How typical of the sensitive poet. But I'm neither a terribly ironic sort of person, nor generally given to tears. And ever since this incident of weeping, I've been thinking about Judith Butler's essay, Violence, Mourning, and Politics, in which she writes, many people think that grief is privatizing, that it returns us to a solitary situation and is, in that sense, depoliticizing. But I think it furnishes a sense of political community of a complex order. And it does this, first of all, by bringing to the fore the relational ties that have implications for theorizing fundamental dependency and ethical responsibility. If my fate is not originally or finally separable from yours, then the we is traversed by a rationality that we cannot easily argue against. One of the implicit questions this passage contains for me is the necessity of identifying that you as human by which I mean to push against Butler's anthropocentric definition of political community. I wept for Pennsylvania's water as much as its citizenry because our fates are not separable. The human cannot be split from the fates of water or earth or air. As the Buddhist teacher Robert Aiken writes, we are all of us completely and absolutely dissimilar, living in complete and absolute dependence upon one another. The ecological philosopher Timothy Morton might further remind us that life is inextricably bound up with non-life. Given our shared ontological situation, I'm arguing that I want to extend our imagination of political community not only to animals and plants, but also to the non-human others that we often characterize as not living, but which nonetheless constitute life as we know it. And I'm arguing that my tears, my horrible, typical poet's tears, were shed not for some idealized nature lost to industry, but for the fact that my state legislature has violated the political and ontological bonds between Pennsylvania's water tables and aquifers and its human citizens. The grief I feel about the wound being dealt to Pennsylvania's water is the kind of grief that displays, Butler writes, the thrall in which our relations with others hold us in ways that we cannot always recount or explain, in ways that often interrupt the self-conscious account of ourselves we might try to provide, in ways that challenge the very notion of ourselves as autonomous and in control. Let's face it, we're undone by each other. And if we're not, we're missing something. At first, the idea that water, earth, and air, among all other phenomena, are members of our political community might seem acutely animistic, are naively anthropomorphic, but I think it's more an awareness of the interdependence of elements and citizenry, the import of the fact that we are, each of us, 75% water. How could we not grieve for the loss of what we ourselves are made of?
without water, we would literally be undone. I'm saying that grief with an ontological basis levels the playing field of the real, and that political reality in the US is both anthropocentric and insufficiently philosophical, <laughs> to say the least. Shortcomings that keep it from acting in the interest of both living and non-living beings. Essentially, I'm making claims that oxygen and hydrogen and other elements are in and of themselves what Judith Butler calls grievable bodies because they constitute the foreignness to myself that is paradoxically the source of my ethical connection with others. What if we had to rewrite our laws to reflect a real in which human consciousness is not a privileging fact, but rather one object among many, like a shale molecule or the Delaware River, and that consciousness must coexist with other objects without intentional violence? Ecology must imagine subjectivity, and I'm not a fan of must statements, but I like this one. Timothy Morton argues, as starting from this shared sensual space in which objects smack, insinuate, and burst into one another. But because we continually fail to adequately adjust our politics and industries to the ever more obvious consequences of legislation privileging the human, many of us continue to grieve not only the the pollution and destruction of our most irreducible relational ties. We also grieve the perpetual legal and political construction of the smallest possible model of reality, a reality implicitly based on the reproduction and accumulation of power and wealth wrought by local and international violence against humans and others. The obvious problem with such mourning is that in the face of our ethical failures to change the situation, its duration and scale can be paralyzing. And I think a lot of, especially those of you who are activists, um, you know, in the Elizabethan era, there was this idea of the great chain of being, like of this long, you know, like hierarchy of things. And I think in our time, it's been re replaced by the great chain of grieving, that we think like, oh, I bought the styrofoam cup, and the styrofoam cup is going to end up in the ocean, and a sea turtle is going to eat it, and it's going to choke, and then it's going to die, and then the turtles won't be born, and then the turtles will die out, and it will be my fault because I bought the styrofoam cup on the morning of blah, blah, blah. You know, like, and I feel like many people do that. It's a luxury problem, obviously, like, I think. But I feel like that sense of, like, we know now with globalization and with the garbage patch in the Pacific and with everything that we know, we know how connected we are actually in a way that we never have. Um, and I think the pressure of that is bonks. I think it makes us crazy um, and sad. And I'm not arguing against it, but I'm saying knowing that that, connect, that sense of overwhelming connectivity is actually overwhelming is a good one. So. We get, we get paralyzed in the face of this. So the poet Juliana Spar, who's coming, right? Yeah, so she'll be here, she's amazing. Juliana Spar writes of this emotional and ethical paralysis in her poem, Unnamed Dragonfly Species, a text that splices a list of greatly diminished or endangered species with a prose narrative about the anxiety and grief that stem from the ethical position of being ontologically interconnected with everything while being complicit in its destruction. And this is her. They were anxious and they were paralyzed by the largeness and interconnectedness of systems, a largeness of relation that they liked to think about and often celebrated, but now seemed unbearably tragic. Upland sandpiper. The connected relationship between water and land seemed deeply damaged, perhaps beyond repair in numerous places. Vesper sparrow. The systems of relation between living things of all sorts seemed to have become in recent centuries so hierarchically human that things not human were dying at an unprecedented rate wavy rayed lamp muscle. And the systems of human governments and corporations felt so large and so distant from them, yet the effects of their actions felt so connected and so immediate to what was happening. Whippoorwill. They knew this, but didn't know what else to do. One of the implicit satisfactions of Spar's text is that it has been written despite not knowing what else to do. And though critics and poets themselves never tire of castigating poetry for its political inefficacies. It's clear that in this text and in others in her recent book, Well Then, There Now, Spar uses poetry to reimagine political community, specifically by intervening how and what we grieve. 
In the same way that the elegy as a genre has irrevocably inflected the ways we as private individuals experience grief and death, Spar's political poetry offers up the public expression of grief as an important and formative aspect of citizenship. That this public grief stems from the failure of human citizens to honor their interconnectedness and indebtedness to non-human others is perhaps her work's most radical claim. This claim is made especially persuasive in her haunting poem, Gentle Now, Don't Add to Heartache, a litanic engine of repetitions that combines the energy of Whitmanic anaphora with the odd gravitas of Greek ritual. The litany begins as a song of connection to and love for the unnamed stream of Spar's rural Ohio childhood. We loved the stream, and we were of the stream. And we couldn't help this love because we arrived at the bank of the stream and began breathing and the stream was various and full of information and it changed our bodies. This is where we learn love and where we learn depth and where we learn layers and where we learn connections between layers. This connectivity is philosophical in the sense that philosophy is a love of knowledge and such knowledge both teaches the speaker what to love and changes the terms of the human to include significant relation to and incorporation of the non-human. Our hearts took on new shapes, new shapes every day as we went to the stream every day, she writes. Our hearts took on the shape of the stream and became riffled and calmed and muddy and clean and flooded and shrunk and dry. Her recounting of this process culminates in a rapturous outpouring of data and the admission of vulnerability, a list of her bioregions, riverine and riparian species, each of whom is entreated, gentle now, don't add to heartache. After these instances of intimate address with which the human recognizes her bond with non-human others, the poem slowly changes into a lament, first for the environmental degradation of the stream, and then most profoundly for the moment when the speaker first turns from non-human others toward humans and then toward consumer culture. Spar is ruthless in her assessment of the speaker's betrayal of the non-human others whose relational ties formed her and whose co-presences taught her to love on an ontological level. And this is her. What I did not know as I sang the lament of what was becoming lost and what was already lost was how this loss would happen. I did not know that I would turn from the stream toward each other. I did not know I would turn to each other. Ensnared, bewildered, I turned to each other and from the stream. I turned to each other and I began to work for the chemical factory and I began to work for the paper mill and I began to work for the atomic waste disposal plant and I began to work at keeping men in jail. I turned to each other. I didn't even say goodbye, elephant ear, mountain mad tom, butterfly. I replaced what I knew of the stream with life stream, total cholesterol test packets, with snuggle, emerald stream, softener, dryer sheets. What moves me about this passage is that Spar makes most grievable the failure of the speaker to mourn her loss of relation to the stream and its species. The unnamed stream is ironically replaced by a stream of seemingly interchangeable products, all of whose elaborate names contain the word stream, but which nonetheless fail to individuate them, like the species whose singularity taught love. The failure to grieve the loss of this relatedness, Spar seems to digest, suggest, stems from the monetary necessities of labor, the distractions of commodity culture, and the especially seductive relatedness we share with each other, with other humans. Outlining the interconnected of systems of labor, commodity, and libido that structure and drive capitalist culture and economy, Spar indicts the failure of our culture to grant equal weight and importance to our relationships with non-human others. She points especially to our failure to count the ties we make with non-human others as constituting occasion for theorizing our fundamental dependency and ethical responsibility. Appropriately, Spar's poem turns the failure to grieve the speaker's loss of relatedness to the stream and its species and to a public occasion to grieve. The poem's close even juxtaposes the intimacy of the erotic with fragments of Greek lamentation. I just turned to each other and the body parts of the other suddenly glowed with the beauty and detail I had found in the stream. I put my head together on a narrow pillow and talked with each other all night long and I did not sing. I did not sing, oh, to to toy, dark, all merged together, oi. I did not sing groaning words. I did not sing, oh, to to toy, dark, all merged together, oi. I did not sing groaning words. I did not sing, oh, woe, 
whoa, whoa. I did not sing, I see, I see. I did not sing, whoa, whoa. I'm haunted by the suggestion of the penultimate line, namely that a lack of vision leads to a lack of singing, and that perhaps the opposite is also true, that we do not clearly see when we do not sing. And I'm haunted by the suggestion that not only that the real body is forth in our ontological relation to non-human others, and that to name or sing these others makes us accountable for them and accountable to them, but that naming or singing also makes them accountable to us, our relation fully interdependent. It is not as if an I exists independently over here and then simply loses a you over there, Butler writes, especially if the attachment to you is part of what composes who I am. Thus I am haunted by Spar's suggestion that one of our great failures lies in not counting among our losses, a loss of connection and accountability to the non-human others we live among and with, and that another failure lies in not knowing or remembering these non-human others well enough to see them and name them in song and make their lost bodies cause of our grief, cause for our grief. But I am probably most haunted by Spar's implication that our culture's definition of the human to labor, to buy, to love, is by its very nature an ethical void because the human, enthralled to its other attachments, can no longer see the crucial and intimate nature of its dependence on the non-human. If this laboring, buying, loving human ensures not only the erasure of non-human others, but also the erasure of the knowledge that our lives were all along tied to theirs, perhaps even most tied to theirs and their destruction, then to labor, to buy, and to love are all grievable actions. The poem names these failures in order to mourn them. The poem mourns the fact that there is no human who is not harmed. The poem mourns our failure to be gentle, we have each of us, citizens all, added to heartache and failed to see it. That is why we must sing. So questions? I know that was a lot, a lot, a lot. That's a really great question. I mean, I think for me, as probably for a lot of you, people do activism in all sorts of ways and in at really different spectrums. It's kind of like a Kinsey scale. Some people are totally a six and some people are more a one and most people are somewhere in the middle. So I, I think like the people I worked with on a lot of the fracking stuff, um, a lot of them were full, like full time, other than their paying job, maybe not even working full time at a paying job, but just really passionate. Everything went toward that. Toward people like me who have a full time job and I was trying to do what I could and get informed and do research and understand what fracking, I'd never really heard of it totally before I moved to Pennsylvania. And then I really was kind of like did a double take and was like, you're doing what here? Like, are you kidding me? And like, no one's like burning the Capitol building. Like I just didn't really understand. So I think for me, activists can connote both full scale, full on, hardcore, total life mission to someone who does what they can when they can in a thoughtful manner, um, but perhaps doesn't have the room or um, the spine or the courage to like sort of do do the total immersion. I think a lot of it in the circles I know also has to do with how much debt you have, how poor you're willing to be, um, 
or not. You know, I, I feel like there's a lot of questions behind it. So I think of activists as someone who's just dedicated to thinking about these questions and doing some actions. Um, but those actions might be really broadly defined. Like again, I'm not a must person. I'm interested in s having people engage with it in the ways that they can. Because um, I think a lot of activist shame happens when you're like, you're not hardcore enough, or you're not really pulling your weight. Which I get, again, when you're doing collective efforts, like I get why that happens is because like three people do all the labor, and then there's like six other people who are like, I'll show up on the day of the event, and everyone else is like, that's nice. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the event. Um, so I think there's a range, and I think it's, it's also true in relation to trying to redress this kind of imbalance in terms of um, the hierarchy between human action and the, and the world of matter, which I think I don't even know. I mean, like, my talks in some ways are so idealistic and so such a utopian thrust. Like, can we ever legislate for the total rights of, like, non-human things? It'd mean, like, how would you eat a carrot, you know, or how would you farm? Like, it would be really hard to figure that, and I don't mean that in a trivial sense. I mean, it would be actually like, where do you draw the line? Like where, how can you get a scent from water or from something like, w would we have to learn how to, you know, figure those things out? So I know that there's a kind of idealism that's unsolvable in my text. And also the idea of wanting these things to have protection, but also being really suspicious of the ways we legislate you know, and how legislation often is so piecemeal and will protect one tiny part of an ecosystem, but then there's like mine, strip mining all around this one like little patch for butterflies, and you're like, are they even gonna, you know, will, the, will this patch even survive, you know? So does that help your question at all, or were you asking something way more specific? I mean, I'll keep thinking about it, but that was a good answer. Okay. Um, you just mentioned earlier how you're surprised that nobody's really burning down the Capitol building over the fracking. And I imagine it's because not, maybe not a lot of people know about fracking. And if they did know, they would raise um, a lot more of a stink about it. So like, as a writer yourself, what do you think would be like a really good way to get it out there mm -hmm. to like a very... Um, very, very public. Yeah, in Philly, there's um, there's a wonderful poet named C. A. Conrad, who hopefully someday you guys will meet, um, and he and some other folks have a Philadelphia. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. They have Pace, and what Pace does, I've done one action with them, where we write poems specifically for the street, and we make little broadsheets, like you know, Xeroxed zini broadsheets, not like really nice ones. And then you go and like actually give readings on the street and hand out these politicized poems to people and sort of make them, like put a confrontation. Normally it's been about anti-war activism, so for them, but for me I really wanted to join on a particular day when they were doing something environmental. Um, because I think, especially in an urban area like Philly, again, Philly has this idea that it's not connected to the rural landscape outside of it that is being fracked. And so I, I did want to bring those ideas and that information into the poetic and into a direct contact with citizens on the street. So I think there are ways, like, I mean, that's one possible way that I thought was fun and interesting and confrontational, like people really were like, what are you doing, like, what are you doing? And Philly is not super friendly. So it's like, people were really like, Fuck you, like I'm trying to go to work. Other people would stop and be like, this is the strangest thing that's ever happened to me in Philadelphia. <laughs> Someone is like reading me a poem, why would you do this? It was, so it was interesting. So I think that is one basic thing, but there's, I'm sure you have, I'm sure everyone in this room has lots of really good ideas, other ideas. I wanna make a plea for you to read one of your poems um, because I wanna, I wanna hear from you about the different sort of processes that you go through to produce different forms in response mm -hmm. to the same set of ideas. Well, and what I will say, I, the, the, pro the major problem, I was going to read a newer work that is way more 
to me more informational. Uh, um, and I, maybe I'll just read the first page of it. Um, so I'll read the first page of this. This is a poem called Clearwater Ringa. Fog, error, radar, failed. The container ship hit the bridge tower hard. Its hull split, lost 58,000 gallons of bunker fuel oil, November 7, 2007. The next day it hurt the eyes to walk dockside, wind bringing the sting of petrol. Each piling ringed rainbow, rainbow. From the dock, I watched white boats go, carrying yellow booms. Saw how the reel absorbs a fact, the way a seabird preens its greased wings helplessly, the ordinary gesture gently carrying toxins from feather to beak, from outside to in. It was the first disaster I could walk to, look at, until it ceased to seem exceptional. No matter the panic I felt watching an oiled grebe thrash against capture, no matter the bird slipping in the plastic tub slicked by its own feathers, its rescuer trying to contain it without injury. Easier to watch rescuer soak the bird in warm water and don dish soap. Easier to watch them scrape each feather clean with a kid's toothbrush. Yet, I couldn't get over it. How the reel couldn't refuse, could do nothing but disperse oil from the bay on currents west through the Golden Gate until Sheen, Slick, and Tarball touched everything from Bolinas to the Farallones, the whole coast immersed in the reel it was and was part of. That's the beginning of that poem. And with that, you know, that was a spill in the San Francisco Bay called the Costco Busan spill. A container ship hit the Bay Bridge and then spilled, you know, X gallons, tons of oil into the Bay, which is a protected region. Um, and it was totally like the driver of the ship was drunk, was drunk actually. Um, so it was complete negligence. And it was the kind of, it literally was the first disaster that I'd ever actually been there for and tried to volunteer to clean birds, but you had to actually be trained, trained to do that. Um, but it was, de I mean, I'd never seen anything like it in person, but it's also forgotten you know, immediately. Like, people don't talk about it in the Bay Area anymore. There's still articles every once in a while about the lingering environmental impacts, but it's a lot like the BP spill, um, which is the second half of this poem, because I'm actually from the Gulf Coast. And so um, the two spills kind of linked in my mind. And I, at that point, the point that I wrote the poem, the fact that BP had sp um, sprayed Corexit, the dispersant over the Gulf, was also being hugely not covered. And there was a lot in the alternative media of information about what Corexit is and what it does and the health risks of it and the fact that it was bo actually bonding with the oil and actually more effectively entering the human body after it bonded with oil rather than before, so that it was actually more toxic, the oil was more toxic to the environment and to humans. So the, the, the there's a lot of articles right now, three years out, about how the dolphins are just dying by in scores. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I, I remembered. I wanted to make sure that other people remembered. I wanted, so I wrote a very, docu for me, a very documentary poem, very much more prosy. I mean, I did it in these um, Ranga stanzas, which are syllabic, so they're highly compressed. I tried, tried to find a way to make the language compressed enough so that it would sing, because I was working with so much prose documentation and YouTube footage and, and interviews. Um, but it was a way of like, and I actually really deliberately for the first time tried to publish it in a fancy magazine that I was like, I'm going to send this to Kenyon Review, which has a fabulous circulation and 
because I know one of the editors has an environmental consciousness. And, and so I knew that he might actually be open to this 15 page crazy looking thing that they normally would never publish. Um, and he was, he was really open to it. Um, but I also really wanted it to be out there and it's on their website and I recorded an audio version of it because I want people to remember. And I think it's both that the Bay Area quickly forgot, but also the country doesn't give a shit about the South the southern United States, um, and quickly forgets everything that happens there, if they ever even know about it. And so I wanted to make sure that, that the Gulf Coast um, had some serious props um, for what it went through, what it continues to go through. Um, so I think that's also it, is that, you know, and I would, and I'm doing something like this, you know, which is also important that you guys hear this. Not that I think you're an audience that didn't, was already thinking about these things, but you know, it's important to keep talking about it and make sure that people have it in their minds and don't forget these issues. You know, so that I think is another response. I don't think I asked your question about form, but I maybe addressed it a little bit. Yeah, it took me five years to write it because I didn't. It was overwhelming to me, and the um. And I had not written something like it before. So it took a really long time to figure out how to sort through all the documents, how to organize them in a way that wasn't just an essay. you know. And I also had to figure out, I think for me, what my work has constantly risked is that the human emotional life is there, which risks anthropocentrism, right? But I think that we cannot have an environmental politics that doesn't include our affective ties to the world, to that relationality, that we have to risk the sort of non-ethical stance of having deep feeling about things that are not human and risk our projections onto them that we can counter with an ethics you know, that keeps us from um, doing damage by those ties. And so I really, can, one of the things that um, I confronted in this poem was my sort of hysteria over it, my inability to really think, my deep grief that was just sort of debilitating and um, a little obsessive. Like for five years, I just kept printing out things, keeping newspaper articles, watching this YouTube video over and over again. And not doing anything with it, but just feeling like shit. And I was like, this is inefficacious behavior for an artist. <laughs> Perhaps necessary <laughs> um, time to figure out how I actually think and feel about this. But it was about me. And ultimately, I was really like, Jesus, get off your ass, Brian. And you know, like actually think about these other things, these other creatures these other landscapes that, so, and yeah, the end of the poem, I think, I think the poem is still complicated in that way that I don't think I'm right, or I don't think I produce like the right response or the right answer, but, oh, do you have a question? It's called Clearwater Ringa. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking efficiently. in regards to po eco poetics and I guess one might ask might like if all legislation is recuperative and how do you approach eco poetics with that with <coughs> recuperative recuperation in mind? That's a fabulous, very smart question. The question I I will repeat it as I understand it. So if I've laid out these dangers, right? There's this danger on the queer theory side of a kind of negativity, of a kind of despair, and a kind of rejection of all social goods, right? Like in to, to short circuit the social order. Um, and the reinscription of law upon law upon bodies. But there's also this danger that well, then what do you do? Like, it, any legislation then becomes some way of re, 
inviting material things, not human other humans, non-human others into a legislative sphere that of course is always anthropocentric, right? And so then what, what role does poetry have there? Like, or what position does one take? And for me, I think one thing that is consistent is that you take a relational stance, that it is about the encounter. It is about being in the encounter with other species, with other humans, and being as fully immersed and as attentive to the complexities of that, to bioregional detail, to species-specific detail, to your own phenomenological experience of it, and the ways in which you are, because one really beautiful idea comes from the pheno phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty. His final book is called The Visible and the Invisible. And there's this beautiful chapter at the end called The Chiasm, The Intertwining. And this idea of, of the chiasmus is sort of the, it's a grammatical figure, which I can, and a logical figure, which I actually cannot explain to you right now because it's the end of this long <laughs> lecture. Um, but the way that he talks about it conceptually, I can repeat and will hopefully be useful to you, which is that perceiver and world are mutually enfleshing, that they mutually are intertwined because you and I do not have a flesh or a perception without each other. And that there's a way in which the world and perceiver are mutually intertwined, you know, like this, like interlocked. Via his is like through the gaze, but I th through the gaze, but I think it's also through the actual <laughs> um, fleshiness too, the somatic life of of the po of of I th say the poet of the person, but also of the world that responds, um, and so that to me is what's incredibly important about writing. That all of these poems that I have been writing over the past years, they're all written in. In, while I'm walking, uh, in draft form, like in response to specific places. There is later drafting process where research and things are overlaid on those original, sometimes on the original drafting, but that the original encounter is where the poem starts. And that um, traces of that encounter um, hopefully make its way into the language, into the prosody of the poem, into the taural, linguistic texture, and that to me, that's the ethics. That again, I love that you quoted that part of Wittgenstein, because for me it's the core, the ethics and aesthetics are one, they are not separable. And that you have to find a way to make that true, because often they're taught as separate spheres in our culture, but they aren't. And so for me, it's about that process of field work, of actually writing the poem in the field, of, of then being like, what did I just see? Like, I'm not sure. So a lot of the poems at the end of Companion Grasses, you know, they're written out of particular landscapes that I hiked for years, for years, getting to know them before I really wrote about them, because I just felt like I don't want to write as a stranger, like I want to write as someone who knows you, dear landscape, and the species there. Um, earlier in the book, I risked writing about places I didn't know as well, because I was new to California, and I had to sort of write my way into relation to it. Um, does that answer your question? Because I think you're right, like there's a catch-22 intellectually, and I'm like, on the large scale, I can't answer you, but I can say the emphasis on relationality and encounter and in the ethics of that moment, that is where for me we can do work. That we can, I know we can do work there. The bigger stuff, let's talk. <laughs> like I think we have to figure that out. That's the really hard, hard, hard part. Awesome. I kind of just want to know like what 
Sure. Well, most morality and justice were not mine. Those were Judith Butler's. So um, you should ask Judith. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, to me, I think, and I think morality for me is a term I wouldn't use very often. I think I would use ethics as a preference, personally. And for me, I again, I think my ethics come down to the idea of dependence and interrelationality and intercorporeality, intercorporeality and of not defining things in abstract categories that are, that are uh, cut off from material conditions and, and, and the world itself, the world of facts. So that that's not a definition of ethics per se, but that would be a definition of like my interest in ethics, um, of always having to think of everything as contingent and conditional and that I can't, it's again why I'm not a fan of must, like that's my particular must, like I must do that, I must be thinking that way. Um, but I am also totally open that everyone else would have a totally different way of doing it and that I have to be open to that as well because that's relationality, right? Like that's what intercorporeality means, that your way of being and of being enfleshed in the world is n perhaps not really congruent with mine. And so that idea of being really committed, like Elizabeth Grosch said, to differentiation and to a proliferation of lived difference as opposed to trying to shut things down into one order um, that I control, um, again, is something I'm not, I'm personally not interested in. And I think that's the way that ecosystems actually work, too. You know, I think it's the way that ethics might, might mirror that more closely. Does that help? I just gave you my working definition of it. I am not necessarily. Yeah, and that that is not. I am not using it in a in a way that has been handed down via our normative codes and via our normative social order. Like I am, I am not going to be referring to those particular traditions when I use that word, because I think that's what a lot of work has, is being done right now to put pressure on the history of that word, again, which is logocentric, right? And it's, is about certain rational codes and systems. And if the emphasis can be more on experientiality, right, and on the context-dependent emergence of relation, as opposed to a preset, like, oh, this ex encounter must go this way, because that is what ethics is. Like, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not gonna be comfortable with that. Does that make sense? Right, right, that's also true. So I'm not trying to dodge your question, or, or um, but I don't know if I can give a satisfactory answer to what you want, maybe. Or maybe that's part of my point, is that I'm not going to satisfy that. <laughs> um, but, I, but I understand the desire for a map, right? I understand the desire for terms that are stable. Um, but I also feel like part of my, the point of my talks is that I think for me what's more important is figuring out the map via the context we find ourselves in and the relations we find ourselves in, rather, and that that definition might, of ethics might continually develop and go under change with each encounter. Um, yeah, so I hope that's adequate. As you might suspect, it feels like huge hubris to say that I 
have any role in that at all. I guess my thing is like, I'm a striver. Like I try. I think my role is to try to do better always and to re constantly rethink even the things that I've said today and to constantly question the relationship between aesthetics, um, for, you know, the forms of poetry, the hi my relationship to the history of poetry and its relationship to ethics and to the, the social and political sphere. Um, and that I urge other people to do that, that I urge my students to do that, that as Miranda said, like I write about people who do that, that I try to support that work in as many ways that I can and make it part of the discourse. But I, as an artist, am totally open to being a failure at all of those things, that I don't, I think it's important to risk fucking up and having poems that don't work or that are ethically, you know, like exper experiments in relationality that you kind of have to be like, well, that one really flabbed or like, you know. Um, I think it's pretty crucial to me to do that. And I think it's also really crucial that in many ways we remain unacknowledged legislators or that, that unacknowledgement is actually really a, a kind of a large freedom to kind of do work that isn't always already folded into convent, conventional power structures, um, or at least is trying to resist them even as sometimes I get published in some fancy journal, right? Obviously I'm following some conventions of rules to make it in here, right? Um, but I think your question's a good one. And I think it really is like, and I read a lot of people, a lot of work that ask the question you're asking. And I look at how other people answer that question. And I love people who are more certain than I am. Cause I, um, I think I've made my, cause I was raised very, very, very Christian, right? And I think I've made myself skeptical of any ideological position that is too certain of itself for that reason, because I see the ideological dangers of that. Um, what I think it means is that I can't supply a good ready-made answer of what is ethics, um, because I am constantly dodging that solidity. But I do think that's my work, actually. I've made that flaw, potential flaw into like a place where there's constant change. Um, so I hope that answered your question. I think we're done. You guys were awesome. Thank you for your questions. <laughs>